This is Epicenter, episode 337 with guests Stani Kulachov and Mark Zeller. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Kuchio. Today, my guests are Stani Kulachov and Mark Zeller. Respectively, they are the CEO and integrations lead at Aave. So Aave is building a suite of non-custodial DeFi tools which allow users to earn interest on their deposits and borrow assets. Now, one of the things which brought Aave to some prominence recently was the release of their flash loan product. Certainly, this is something you've all heard about because In recent months, there have been a number of attacks on various Ethereum smart contracts which have leveraged flash loans or some similar mechanism. Mind you, as far as I know, none of these actually involve the Aave flash loan contract. But since we recorded this interview at ETCC, the BZX attack had just happened and it was pretty fresh. So we did talk about it in this conversation. So since their launch, Aave has seen some phenomenal growth. And according to their website, as of today... That's about $50 million locked in Aave, which is about half of the capital in Compound. They support 17 tokens, a number of stable coins, and they're integrated with several wallets and dApps. Now, in terms of user experience, these integrations are important because they allow users to leverage flash loans without the need to write code. Now, this is something that we talked about in the interview as like a hopeful outlook on the future. Well, in just a few weeks since we recorded that, Several codeless applications have emerged that allow people to do just that. So you can now use flash loans in money Legos and literally just drag and drop different components of DeFi in a user-facing application and leverage a flash loan to do refinancing, for example. So here's what you'll learn in this interview. Stani and Mark's background and how they became involved in crypto, the various projects they were involved with previously, including Variable and why that failed. The project which preceded Aave, ETHLAND, and how it switched from an OTC model to the pool model that they have today. We talked about yield hacking and other DeFi use cases. We discussed what is a flash loan, what it's useful for, and how you can use it to do things like DeFi refinancing. We discussed the flash loan attacks, which happened in February, and the specifics of those attacks. We talked about smart contract security and how the community should respond to attacks, and why DeFi privacy is desirable, but so hard to do. So Reset Everything, this event that I've been organizing for the last three or four weeks has come together in ways that I would never have imagined when I first had this idea. Now, if you remember at the beginning, I had this idea to do a conference where I'd get like Bitcoiners and Ethereum people together and discuss their differences, but that has totally just fallen to the wayside. And Reset Everything is becoming, has become a multidisciplinary conference about the paradigm shifts that are happening around us and that will continue to operate in society for the foreseeable future because of this crisis, which is just so huge. So we're going to talk about health and wellness, media and journalism, money and economics, tech and privacy, politics and governance, and work and collaboration. And just look at the website, check out the list of speakers that we have for this conference. I'm just blown away by the the amount of of interest and enthusiasm for these topics. So I'm just going to list off a few here. Amesh Adalja, senior scholar at John Hopkins University. Azim Azar, the founder of Exponential View, the great newsletter which talks about long-term trends in the economy and in industry. Uh, Brian Bellendorf of Hyperledger. Ruth Ben Gate, uh, who's a historian at New York University. She's going to talk about authoritarianism and the risks of authoritarianism post-COVID. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, Corey Doctorow, the author, Yaya Fanusi, who was on the podcast recently, Nick Grossman of Union Square Ventures. We've got uh, Dr. Yelena Kekmenovic, who's a psychologist at Georgetown University, Riva Tez of Intel, Jeff Jarvis, author of What Will Google Do and professor of journalism at CUNY. And the list goes on and on and on. Just check out the website. It's resetEverything.events. It's happening on 29th and 30th. Oh, that's another thing. We got so much response for this. We had to do two days instead of just one. So it's on Wednesday and Thursday of this week. It starts tomorrow as this drops, starting at noon UTC. So check out the website to get your own uh, local time zone set up so that when you go to the website, you see in your local time zone when the talks are happening. 
And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in there, asking questions. We want to make it interactive. We want people to feel free to ask questions and, and ask their questions to these experts. And yeah, so we have about 700 signups right now and hoping to get to a thousand by the time this starts. So come and join us for Reset Everything. We'd love to see you there. Security audits are a vital step for building security into your systems and helping your users, your stakeholders, not to mention your future investors, better understand security risks. And being transparent about your security audits and how you're mitigating vulnerabilities, well, that creates confidence in your product. Least Authority is a security consulting company that conducts software security audits of all sizes, from smart contracts to entire blockchains. And even if you understand the value of a security audit, well, do you know what that process looks like? Do you know how a security audit works? Well, Least Authority is here to help. They guide their clients through the entire process and help them demystify it and end up with a final product, which is a report that you can share with your stakeholders, your users, and the community. So if you'd like to get a better idea of what a security audit could do and could mean for your project, you should join the Least Authority Security Sessions Meetup. It's happening on Thursday, this Thursday, April 30th, and you can learn how to prepare for an audit and how to identify the auditing skill sets that are important for your project. To sign up, go to leastauthority.com slash meetup. Once again, that's on April 30th, and there will be several sessions throughout the day to accommodate for all time zones. And yes, you can go to security sessions and also to reset everything. Now, if you can't make the event for some reason, you can still schedule a free no obligation call with them so they can at least walk you through that security audit process. And you can do that. It's really easy. Just go to the website, leastauthority.com, and there's a big red button there so you can schedule a call. But do try to make the event. It's on the 29th and it's free. You can register at leastauthority.com slash meetup. Crypto to crypto trading has been around for a long time and ShapeShift is one of the pioneers in this space. Back in 2014, when we were just starting the podcast, ShapeShift was creating the first usable crypto to crypto trading platform that allowed you to easily swap one asset for another like Google Translate. Well, they're still innovating, bringing you products that allow you to buy crypto with fiat, trade, track, and secure your digital assets. So to sign up, go to beta.shapeshift.com and here you'll receive 100 free Fox tokens. These tokens allow you to trade commission-free. Each of the tokens is $10 in free trading per month, which means you start with 1000 bucks in free trading. You can connect your ledger, your treasure, or your KeepKey hardware wallet. It's totally non-custodial. And if you don't have a KeepKey, if you don't have a hardware wallet, I'll tell you how you can get a free one. All you got to do is leave us an iTunes review. Go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple or just look for Epicenter in Apple Podcast, leave an iTunes review, take a screenshot, and email me at keepkey at epicenter.tv, and I'll send you a discount code for a free KeepKey hardware wallet, right? So leave an iTunes review, get a free hardware wallet. That's the great deal, right? And you can also sign up at beta.shapeshift.com, and you'll get 100 Fox tokens for free, so you can trade commission-free. And with that, here is our interview with Stanley Kulachoff and Mark Zeller. I'm here with Stanley Kulachoff and Mark Zeller. And so they're respectively the CEO and developer relations at Aave. Aave is a DeFi tool that allows you to do a number of things, uh, including lending, borrowing. And one of the things I think that they're probably most known for in the space at the moment is flash loans because they've released a flash loan product. Now, Flash loans at the moment is being discussed quite a bit, I guess, uh, here at this conference and also, you know, on Twitter, et cetera. And we'll get into that uh, during this interview. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Sebastian. So tell me a bit about your background and, you know, how you guys got involved in crypto. Uh, yeah. So my story is pretty interesting. Uh, I used to be, uh, well, I'm, I have always been a nerd. I would <laughs> Say, Haven't we all? <laughs> <laughs> That's why us. we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and basically uh, ended up going into uh, law school and liked rules and, uh, and, and so forth, but uh, was very intrigued by finance in, in general, uh, more towards financial instruments and all crazy things that you could actually do and create different kinds of uh, products and ended up uh, 
finding about Ethereum uh, back in, I think it was 2016, beginning uh, in Helsinki, slash, which was one of the uh, biggest startup events uh, in the globe. And I just got more interested. I, I found the uh, kind of like, uh, I understood the idea of, of smart contract technology, uh, especially like the immutability and what it can actually bring into financial transactions. And that just got me into thinking like, hey, we could do pretty cool stuff with this. Uh, and let's do something with lending. And, and then we started uh, Eat Lend, which was kind of like the, uh, the legacy of, of Aave. Uh, that was the first lending protocol on Ethereum. And one thing led to another. And then we came the uh, Flash Boys. <laughs> And Mark? Uh, just like this guy, I'm a law school <laughs> dropout, <laughs> but he's not yet, so. <laughs> dropout to be. <laughs> keep, keep faith. I've been involved in Ethereum since 2015. My good friend, Alexander Kurtz, which is around, talked to me about the, this new crazy Bitcoin where you can run code on. And obviously my first reaction is, what a shit coin. <laughs> and then I've been to Reddit and then I spent like three months day and night into the rabbit holes and we created Ethereum France with a few friends and that ended up like the HCC. So that, that's cool. And I work with Consensus on the variable project. Uh, we were trying to make stable coins uh, based on derivative products. And I work for a French broker uh, called Coinos, La Maison du Bitcoin for the French audience. Very, very, very ingrained in the French uh, crypto space. <laughs> Are you <Exactly>. not? <laughs> yeah, already. <laughs> you've been, you've been in every, everywhere here. Everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it's my pleasure to have joined uh, just before the DEFCON uh, at Osaka, uh, the AVE team, uh, for the release of their new protocol and their mindnet. I've been following, I think, Mark from, I think, 2016 with uh, his... his uh, I mean, that was also kind of like a well, DeFi project as well that Mark was uh, building the variable. And uh, it's, it was pretty cool to actually uh, get Mark involved into Aave uh, since Osaka. And, and we have done pretty uh, cool stuff. And then this guy got got the uh, the best crypto swag like, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I, I want to I ask you briefly about, about variable, which you were working on with our common friend, uh, Simon Polaro. Yeah. Um, and so... Do you think that that product was maybe a little bit too early for its time, or are there other reasons why it failed? So I think we learned a lot, and I think it's good for the industry. I see two main reasons uh, for variable failure. One, yes, it was a bit early, uh, because uh, we developed that at the end of 2016. Uh, the product was ready in March, April 2017. It was like even before like the big pump of Ethereum and the crypto bubbles. And yeah, we, we had an alpha with 300 users and it was uh, going on. And but, I was uh, one of them. <laughs> you was one of them. <laughs> but yeah, a bit early. And the second thing is that, to tell the truth, the MakerDAO model, the over-collateralized loans, is much easier to bootstrap than the derivative product. And I'm very happy that MakerDAO uh, prevailed in this uh, industry because that is a very cool product. MakerDAO is a great team. So absolutely no regret on my side. Just uh, to stay on, on Variable, just one moment. Variable was building a stable coin based on, on derivatives. Uh, what, what derivatives? Uh, because, I mean, at the moment, there's like a few derivative products in the space, but what, what, what were those derivatives or what did you intend for those to be? So the main topic today is Aave, so let's keep it short. <laughs> sure, sure. Of so in layman words, uh, when you have a short position and you match that with someone willing to take the option in the other, uh, other side, you can create some sort of somewhat stability from that for third users. And we were based on that. Basically, yeah, not open, but somewhat uh, around that. Basically, when someone takes a long position, someone takes short, uh, you basically uh, hedge that uh, risk. And you, you kind of have the same thing as the uh, over collateral maker DAO system with 200% of work realization. And I, I think that the model was pretty cool. It's just uh, like, for example, uh, back in that same period, we were doing Eatland back in the days. And... Uh, one of the problems we had is that uh, we didn't have any stable coins. And this was the time where MakerDAO wasn't there. There was variable, actually, but wasn't that 
live and the say USDT was on omni chain so it wasn't usable at all yeah. so uh, kind of like uh it was the early days but uh i think it's just about like uh bootstrapping but uh one of the most interesting projects out there uh that time and i i'm pretty sure that the same model will be launched now i mean there is there's a lot of derivative products coming out but pretty cool yeah i think it, it will happen eventually like the situation is way better now to launch this kind of product sure yeah it seems that the, the, the ecosystem is much more mature now there's some sort of stable foundations the use cases are, are are starting to emerge and the most important thing there's actually volume on chain now which was always the case <laughs> but not that much in 2016 one one thing about the volume this is something that uh i don't know that everyone probably understands but uh like we are looking at the dex volumes all the time and they're growing and now that we have the uh flash loans what people are trying to argue that you should not use let's say dex dex oracles when when you're building systems but one of the kind of issues are that the more you have dex volume uh the more you will have lending volume and that basically means that the ratio will be always the same and you can do always the same kind of uh flash attacks if there is uh decentralized uh oracles if you get your price from uniswap kyber there will be always this kind of like busy uh, type of attacks that we will talk about a bit shortly yeah. and i'm not sure if people understand that yet and not sure how it will be solved actually let's let's talk about Ave for for a moment and talk about what you've built and what what you're solving in the space like what did you introduce to the space that wasn't there before yeah so uh in the very be beginning well it was pretty much first lending protocol it was OTC style so whatever asset you actually have you could just collateralize and borrow against and different uh, lenders can take the risk so after that uh what we actually did is um uh we Notice that the pooled model. Now that we have stable coins on the uh, uh, ecosystem, and there was successful pooled models, for example, Uniswap, Compound, we basically turned Eatland into Aave, which meant going from uh, order matching, lending and borrowing into pooled model, where you can grab the liquidity instantly as a borrower, and you can just deposit as a lender and start earning, which is very powerful. So just, uh, model. just to sort of recap there, you know, with a pooled model, you 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 put all the liquidity in one pool. And then you, exactly. you know, bor borrowers borrow from that liquidity instead of matching directly like a borrower with a lender, like exactly. more traditional. Exactly. And that was pretty, uh, it was pretty much the idea of the uh, compound model. And, and, and that was part particularly the DeFi narrative, uh, narrative at that point. And we wanted to expand the narrative and trying to think like how we bootstrap more liquidity. Because end of the day, the whole Web 3.0 uh, network effect is liquidity. So uh, you get liquidity when you know how to yield hack. So the, the, the thing that people are doing now is yield hacking. How you get more yield from your protocol. And that's why we see things like iron curve, where people are trying to get more, more APR and APIs and more yield. And flash loans was part of this strategy. So we introduced flash loans into the protocol to get basically more compatibility and more earnings to the uh, depositors because all those uh, flash loans that are executed on the uh, oh there's the rest of the other guys <laughs> waving so the more actually there is uh, usage of flash loans and people are building cool products in different hackathons and uh, we're not basically we get more yield for the depositors and since they're rewarded to bring the liquidity we, we get basically more liquidity and we do this kind of like a yield hacking interesting can you, can you explain a bit more of this sort of the yield hacking? Give yeah, give, give, give a real life example. Yeah. So uh, I have a few land, which is all native tokens, and uh, they are just sitting around. So I deposit that in Aave, obviously, because the, the rates are not very high, but I can use that as a collateral. And one of the cheapest stablecoin we have, uh, given the situation today, is uh, TUSD and USDC. So... I, I used my land as a collateral. I borrowed some USDC. I swapped thanks to Curve and at a very low slip page, my USDC to USDT, which is Tether. And that USDT, I deposited it in iEarn.Finance. That's going to switch uh, to the best uh, yield of, the, of DeFi and, and mint me some YUSDT which is the tokenization of a deposit in iEarn and that YUSDT 
NFT. I deposit that into uh, as a liquidity provider into Curve. So at the end of the day, I borrow at five-ish percent some USDC, and I've got some USDT deposited, and I get the Aave yield plus the iron yield plus the curve yield, and I end up with 23% APR. So I pay 6% and I get 23 And that's basically yield tracking. And in DeFi, when you are aware of the opportunities, you can actually make money with money. Are there any tools that sort of like simplify this sort of... Uh... I have the feeling that the iron and curve guys are the best fit in the ecosystem to create this kind of stuff. Yeah, because right now it's all about being able to monitor and understand what are the protocols out there, what are the risks, because obviously when you uh, write uh, the yield of several protocols, you also take the risk of several protocols. And, and that's why uh, the tools like DeFi, De DeFi Score are really important. They give grades to uh, the main protocols. And there's also DeFi Zap uh, doing this kind of recipes. So yeah, right now it's really manual, but soon you will click one button and get them. But it's uh, called, this kind uh, of opportunities. Cool name the uh, yield riding actually. It's better than the yield hacking. And th this uh, what actually Mark explained is is kind of like uh, semi somehow semi simple compared to what's coming up. Like you might have uh, a transaction chain of. Or, or just different, it doesn't have to be like flash loans and everything in the same transaction, but different kind of uh, uh, thing that you are going to do. You might have 20, 30, uh, 40 different transactions just to grab that extra yield. And then you have algorithms running and doing. And I think because, uh, as uh, my previous said, that the liquidity is, is the uh, network effect in, in DeFi, uh, there will be de developers like Iron and, and Curve where they're building for end users to actually take that opportunity like a lot of things what's the do you think the upside for these teams is to build these tools or actually go and like exploit these opportunities what's what's the biggest upside for them i think the well i haven't talked with about that with them but i think they are also liquidity providers so yeah. the the more liquidity they have the more attractive the protocol is and they they earn the same yield than everyone like when the incentives are aligned, that's usually good outcomes. Yeah, I think because like liquidity isn't like unlimited. It feels now in DeFi that there is there is enough funds everywhere, and there's a lot of kind of like people in Ethereum that that have, I mean, are whales, and with flash loans now everyone is a whale, <laughs> whale kind of like. And and the thing is that it still will it will be unlimited. I mean, limited, and you have to build for others as well to get that liquidity. And it's just like, we can always look at the traditional finance and and how the money is structured there, and it's pretty much will be the same in DeFi. What other use cases are, are, are you seeing on, on Aave, aside from this uh, yield writing? Uh, what, are, what are people using uh, ETHLAND for? Uh, what, how Aave is used uh, from, for example, okay, the, the very first thing is you deposit an error. That's like the very easiest way to start doing things. So um, you, deposit, you deposit, say you have like 100 ETH, you deposit it, and you'll... You'll earn yield, say from like Compound or from yeah, compounded interest like basically, and and stable coins are pretty pretty cool thing. So we try to have very diverse set of stable coins because they bear less risk than compared to um, using asset different assets as collateral. So so basically, we try to have very diverse set of uh, stable coin offerings, and and basically on the borrower side, you can deposit let's say ETH that you are long on, and and then you can basically borrow a stable coin. Leverage up by buying uh, some other currency, or you can just convert it to euros or dollars and spend that those funds in real life. And with flash loans, you can do crazy stuff like you can actually swap your collateral. You, you, if you have it uh, as a collateral, you can swap it to another collateral, for example, Link, um, or you can just go 50-50 or whatever is the your strategy and do a bunch of other uh, interesting things. Before we were talking about some of the applications for this, um, and one of them was refinancing. Uh, can, can you just sort of explain how one would leverage refinancing and, and what the opportunities there are to sort of get better rates? Yeah, so the, 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 the most interesting thing about refinance is that, let's say, uh, we can take an example. Uh, you have a uh, CDP open, well, make it our world, and you're paying, let's say, uh, hypothetically, the stability fee is, for example, 8% on DAI. So you collateralize E to borrow DAI. 
and now you have spent that die in real life. Let's say you have uh, you have bought a uh, Ford Focus, right? <laughs> and then uh, what happens is that uh, you see that there is at four uh, percent the very same amount of loan on USDC, but that's in, for example, Compound. So what you could do actually, you could refinance return, re- returning that die loan by taking a flash loan from Aave, uh, closing the CDP, taking that ETH that was collateralized, uh, putting it into Compound and taking USDC and swapping that USDC into uh, DAI in Kyber or Uniswap and returning that loan <laughs> back to Aave. And, and then you have refinanced yourself from uh, higher interest yield rate to lower interest uh, rate without returning the loan. And you're super happy now. I feel like we next in the video we need to have like <laughs> you know borrow die from <laughs> from a maker and then like just sort of like the steps so that people can see how, how this, uh... that's the very cool thing about uh, an ecosystem of nerds is that all of those things all those interaction very complex transactions that are based on thirty or forty blockchain interaction. For the end user, you click on a button. Yes. Like doing the, exactly yeah. that uh, on collateralswap.com, it's one click. Yeah. You don't even as as a user to understand what exactly is happening. Obviously, everything is auditable. So if you want to dive down, if you want to, to understand what happened, you can see and follow the trails of money. But at the end of the day, for the end user, they don't even know. That mm. complexity. They just know yeah. that they swap a eight percent burden to a four percent burden, and that's cool for us. And what was the project in East London? Uh, one bridge, right? Yeah, that one bridge. Asked, yeah. Uh, yeah, from uh, one inch uh, exchange guys. So basically, uh, collateral swap is based from swapping within MakerDAO, and one bridge is swapping between different lending protocols. So just like the example of Stani. So this is not science fiction. This is live today on mainnet. So you, and it's one yeah. click of the button. You don't have to be an hardcore developer. You don't have to understand everything about DeFi to actually do this today. Let's d- dive into to flash loans a little bit more. So explain for our listeners, what is a flash loan? And for how long has this idea existed? Is it a new idea in DeFi? Or has it existed in sort of traditional finance before? Uh, yeah, I, I think from traditional finance, I mean, there's occasions where you, you just need to borrow to settle accounts for a very short period of time. Uh, the, the very like normal stuff can be overnight loans, but uh, they they might be shorter. Like in in Finland, we used to have we used to call this kind of like minute money, uh, where you need to open a company and you have to put two and a fi- five thousand euros on the account, but you just needed to do it for that particular visit to the bank account, and then once you have done it, you can return those funds to whatever you borrowed them. So you actually don't need that that capital, but you just need for a specific transaction. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, DeFi ecosystem, there was a couple of uh, previous iterations of flash loans, and I, I think as a concept, it's not that like new because of the I mean the atomicity of Ethereum has been known from from the very get go. Uh, but I think what made them pretty popular is is that uh, we tried to do the flash loans to the uh, developer community. And, and into the different hackathons. And that's why we see people building things and getting a bit of network effect. And what end, end up happening is that people are looking, okay, here's a very cool thing, how I could actually use to make a lot of money. And, and then we saw the, uh, the, the hacks that exactly. happened on BZX. So you're saying that the, the uh, recent proliferation of flash loans are the, the developer tools that have been built in, in part by Aave to, to make these things easily accessible. You know, we basically improve the developer experience by, I think, by a significant uh, amount. We also did advertise something that was existent but very not very well marketed. So yeah. to, uh, to tell the truth, uh, it's during the, uh, the BZX uh, incident that uh, I discovered that uh, DYDX had some kind of functionality that can work like a flash loan and nobody was aware of like, and we are, super, we are specialists in the, uh, in the ecosystem. And so, yeah, uh, I think we, the possibility were always here, but we, uh, as we uh, develop tools that are accessible on our protocol, uh, we unleash the, the creativity of uh, developers. And I think it's still early days. I, I think it's just, we are, I mean, there's on a daily basis from five to 15 flash loans a day. 
uh, with the other protocol and, and it's fully utilized by compatibility. So it's not flash loans within our own protocol, but it's actually uh, someone refinances a loan, someone uh, does some sort of a margin trading, um, collateral swap and, 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 and whatnot. And arbitrage is one of the big use cases. I think Mark will uh, explain a lot of about this. Uh, like we were seeing like this amount of flash loan, it really reminds me of like the very early days of DeFi and Ethland where like we see like small loan transactions and, and 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 just when things are getting bigger and there's more tools, compatibility, and then we will start to see like more and more utilization. And that is the very momentum where you need to think of how you reward the liquidity providers because uh, at some point the, the let's say, uh, Thousand ether, ten thousand ether might not be sufficient. You might need more liquidity for the uh, flash lending activ- activity that will be happening in the uh, DeFi ecosystem. So, just in, in Ave, like last night, I was playing around with the platform. So, when you go to the website, you you, you can log in with your you know your Web three. Web three wallet, and you have access to to the lending and the borrowing. The flash loans, though, are are more of a sort of developer feature. Like you, you need to write smart contract code in order to execute this flash loan to build these transactions. Are you guys moving towards a product where it's more sort of click, more of a user interface where people will be able to kind of compose their flash loans uh, in the browser? And so I have two answers to that. Uh, the first one is we really see ourselves as a protocol. So we are really open to third-party developers and we try to accompany them. Basically, it's my main job at Aave uh, to make uh, the third-party developer life easier. And we really embrace uh, the, the strategy that uh, third parties can build upon our protocol uh, dApps that do exactly that. And that's basically what is already happening. Like 1x.ag, also done by the one inch guy, allows you to use Flash Loan to uh, do margin trading. And that's a good part of the Flash Loan volume uh, that exists today. Uh, collateral swap, uh, the, all these kind of features. And yeah, I really have the vision of the protocol and people built upon that. It's the whole money Legos uh, ethos, and I do believe in that. The, the cool part is like so many people have asked, like, hey, is there like a, a drag and drop uh, thing and to test it out? And I want that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ex- 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 exactly. <laughs> you and Peter was talking about it yesterday, the whole day, and I was, I was thinking about this and uh, actually Jordan from our team was uh, trying is trying to push really hard forward with this that someone could build build this kind of things and we have a very interesting developer community now it's growing super fast and it just I'm pretty sure that someone will do this pretty soon and and then basically you could just try to do different kind of like if this then that uh, style yeah type exactly of, uh, that's, flash that's what we need we need like yeah. a if this and that for flash loans yeah yeah exactly Should like a zapier for flash loans yeah <laughs> Well, I, I know for sure that Gelato Finance is looking f- carefully at our yeah. code right now. And these kind of guys like uh, Z- Defi, uh, DeFi Zap. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Like uh, Gel- Gelato is building the if this and that. So The very cool sign uh, that this is happening is that we have to remind ourselves that the protocol is live for two months, like only two months. I yeah. think this is an important <laughs> yeah. thing. Yeah. We, it's, it's brand new, like it just came out. Yeah. In only two months, we already have like several cool live projects right now on mainnet that you can use one click of a button that tells something about the developer community that we we are part of. Like people are actually looking at the codes. I, I have like dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds of uh, Telegram groups with developers that are actually building. Uh, every two weeks we do the integration uh, recap and there's new stuff happening every day. This so yeah, cool. it's going to happen. And- I think the like the, the collateral swap actually was born in a way that I was um, brainstorming in Telegram with Mariana Conti and saying, "Hey man, how does the uh, collateral changing? Can I open like a position with uh, a little bit of BAT and a little bit of ether, like rest in ether collateral?" And Mariana said that that's basically not supported at this moment. And and I was thinking, well, actually, you could use flash loans probably to do this. And we're brainstorming a moment, and then I uh, made a tweet about this. Hey, actually. This is one of cool use case for flash loans that you could actually do, and this kind of like collateral swap. And then I asked, like, can someone build this thing? <laughs> and then what, there was uh, David actually uh, from our community. Well, just came later to our community, but uh, with the collateral swaps. But basically, what was funny is that uh, he said, "Hey, this looks interesting. I will try to actually build this thing." 
and then he just built it and, <laughs> and he done it. <laughs> yeah, and there's like people are using it, so it's just like uh, it's a very cool like period, not just like for Lashlon, but for us as well, like to experience like how many people are like interested in trying to do different kinds of things. That's just pretty cool. Interesting. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about this uh, this recent attack, which um, which happened just a few weeks ago over during East Denver. Yeah. Describe sort of what happened. Let, let's play out the scenario of how this attack was discovered, and and, and then we can, I guess, dive into the uh, more ethical, philosophical. How many attacks? Three or two in total. Well, two to the best two. of my knowledge. Yeah. But, you know. And third was a t- trial. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first thing I want to say on this subject is that uh, it's not an attack on Ave. Like sometimes uh, we can see... A, a, because a, Ave a, was used. No. No. No, okay. no. So it's not an attack on Ave. Uh, so Ave was not Ark. Yeah, there's some co- confusion. Uh, flash loan from Ave was not used. Ah. So basically they used uh, the Ninja loan. So I don't know the name they use of uh, DYDX, which is... Kind of flash loans, mm. but uh, a bit more limited because you can only do it, uh, I think, in their yeah. platform or something like that. And the second attack was the flash loan from BZX. So they add some flash loan somewhat. So And they use that because uh, BZX did not have uh, re-entrancy uh, preventions in, uh, building in the protocol. So basically, if you want to use Ave flash loan and use that liquidity uh, inside the Aave protocol uh, or a smart contract architecture uh, doesn't allow you to do that because obviously uh, you can do like some kind of um, like circular logic uh, issue and uh, that's a bad practice to do that and they did not have that and that was basically the second hack. So yeah, yeah. Can, can you talk about the, the specific attack and sort of how that role, how that played out like the, the, the different steps uh, or the different like Transactions in the, in the in the attack and how it was leveraged to walk away with a couple hundred thousand dollars. The first one was pretty uh, straightforward. So basically, they took a flash loan uh, in in it and and basically converted uh, to I think uh, WBTC was it that way and and then they pushed the price down in in uh, the decentralized exchanges, which affected basically the price of uh, Uniswap to to plunge on uh, WBTC. And at the same time, half of the funds that they attacker had he basically took a leverage position in bzx so he basically broke the bit their oracle there and and made money at the same time with the uh, short position that was leveraged and and then uh, uh that was a pretty much about it so the the kind of challenge is that the um in bzx they took the prices from decentralized exchanges uh Kyber, which also uh routes stuff to the uh, uniswap and when the price was pushed down Basically, that was the moment when problems happened. And because they had a short position on leverage, which basically means that they need less money to, to gain more money, they basically exploited this uh, situation. So the, the, the situation that they exploited had to do, I mean, mostly with the fact that the price feed on Uniswap for WBTC, they, there was only one price feed, I believe, right? And so it's more about liquidity. It's not a Uniswap, yep. like the V1 of Uniswap doesn't really have a price fit. Like uh, the, the smart contract of Uniswap are pretty simple in terms of uh, architecture. So basically the only job of Uniswap is to keep 50% worth of one asset and 50% worth of the other asset, no matter the amount of units of uh, asset A and B. And the only way Uniswap defined the price is through market uh, making opportunities, uh, arbitrage opportunities. Right. So if the price is higher or lower on Uniswap than other platforms, like they bet that people will take advantage of that to actually make money through arbitrage. And obviously, when there's opportunity to make money, usually there's someone to take it. So it does work. But I will not say that Uniswap have any kind of oracle of price feed because it's like a sending arbitration based price feed. Okay, but wh- where was the uh, where was the the sort of because I, I so the the WBTC liquidity on Uniswap is quite low, so you don't need that much money to okay. uh, to affect change the price, yeah. affect the price a lot. Okay, I, I thought there was something to do with with price feeds at some some point there. Um, uh, it's the way the um, BZX. 
understand the price yes. of right. uh, WBTC and if you can manipulate somewhat easily uh, the price on Uniswap and Uniswap is part of the uh, price feed, then you can manipulate the price on BZX and take profit out of that. Okay. But right, Uniswap right. So it was, it was is the other way around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah understood. Well, it's not exactly this, but me, it's a simplified version of what happened. What was the reaction in, to this attack and you know, what was sort of your take on what this sort of signals for the space generally? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the very big reaction it was, I mean, if you look at the big picture, it was basically that there's risks in DeFi and systems are being built, not properly audited. And, and the thing is that the TVL, so which is like the total locked value of a uh, smart contract of a specific uh, DeFi protocol, uh, they're growing a lot. Like every protocol has been growing substantially. And the thing is that when you have more and more this asset under management, uh, what you need to do is is put more diligence and, and more audits and, and into the uh, code. And in this case, also, like uh, especially the second attack, by the way, there was actually a third attack, but it happened a couple of months before. So uh, in BusyX as well. And that was the one-inch guys actually exposing exposing it. So what in the second was funny is that there was a uh, poor implementation of the flash loans in that particular protocol, and, and they got flashed themselves. And it just shows that even though like, the innovation that needs to be put into the space to keep it growing and keep it like uh, moving forward, it has to be done very carefully because uh, you need to have really good protocols and the risks are too high. And it just takes one protocol to go bust, to lose the whole fate into the space and take two years to people regain interest again, like we had with the, the DAO hack. We have to remind ourselves that this is not uh, the beginning of 2018 anymore. Like, there's real amounts in DeFi, one billion, uh, a bit less due to uh, the markets right now, but around a, a billion dollars. Like, we we are a 28 million dollar uh, protocol. Yeah. And audits takes time. Audits are painful. Uh, audit, and they're expensive. Uh, and they are crazy expensive. Like. Uh, Nobody takes audits for funds, but if we do it, it's because we the safety is always of, of our users and the security is our top priority. Do you think and, that causes a barrier to entry that a lot yeah. of projects can't? I mean, I know this was talked about last night yeah. at your yeah. at your event. The the thing is like uh, with with the uh, security that has been put in. I mean, I think office budget is like half a million a year on smart contract audits solely. So it's it's and it's just growing, and I I don't think where is the kind of like a cap and. Prices aren't going any any lower, and we kind of have the responsibility to take more, put more effort to make sure that we we have done things right, and that raises the barrier. So in one way, like the flash loans, they're kind of uh, reducing the barrier to enter and create uh, products without liquidity. It's very difficult to overcome the security challenges, and I think that's uh, that is a barrier, and it becomes even more difficult to enter into the DeFi space. I quite agree on that. I'm curious. If you have any thoughts about you know, who are the losers here, like, of course, we can talk about like the the funds that that were that were taken, and but do you think that the the sort of the space keeps taking a reputational hit every time this happens, or or, or is it uh, you know protocols that are not well audited? And I mean, one one thing that I was thinking about last night is this is maybe like a relatively new type of attack. You know, do do audits even pick up this this sort of thing, or is it you know when they happen that that all of a sudden now like smart contract auditing firms are 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 looking at this specific type of attack and and mitigating it? Yeah, because I mean, like the attack itself kind of existed because if you have the liquidity, you could do the same trick. But uh, now everyone, like uh, as uh, Mark you <laughs> wrote previously, like now you used to have like nerds. And now you have like nerds with well like liquidity, and now you can actually perform that with technical knowledge, those kind of uh, attacks. But I, I think every kind of like a hit is also an opportunity to show like how things will be like uh, uh, how how the aftermath is treated, how you communicate message, and how you can improve things and raise standards. So every hit is also like uh, uh, opportunity to make things better and more resilient. I think so, right? Yeah, we we all have to learn. In the context of, is it uh, too expensive to, to build on DeFi right now because you have to audit? Uh, I want to remind also that compared to the state of Ethereum in 
late 2015 or 2016, there's been a lot of job into uh, standardization. So basically, uh, let's say a stupid example right now, building a ERC-20, you go to OpenZPLIN, the contracts are there, it's like copy-paste. Uh, in 2016, that was not as much the case. The standard ERC-20 was already there, but the tools were not as good as today. And I think we are growing like more and more stuff as standardized. There's more and more open libraries. Uh, there's more and more code you can build upon, like safe code, audited code, use code, tools from the community. So it's easier and easier to get started. But yes, uh, audits are really expensive, but every dollar spent there are well spent exactly. and wisely spent. So exactly. uh, we accept that uh, price gladly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, what I like to add um, in, in Mark's uh, also thought is that what's interesting that you don't need to build actually in infrastructure layer, you don't need to build a like another AB or another, another compound because like you have the infrastructure providers already that where you can get the liquidity and basically there's the application layer where you can build a lot of cool stuff and with with more uh, quicker way and and you don't need to have the of course you need to have very high, like high high security but basically it's not the same as in infrastructure um, smart contract level so in in kind of like Noting that that you can still be a developer, make a cool hack in in like places like it, it London and and so forth, and actually just create a new product that people will use and that get audited. And I think simplicity is the key. We're building a lot of complexity, but uh, we just need to find simple ways to build uh, very interesting things. For example, a rate rider like uh, Iron Dot Finance. Uh, we are big fans of uh, what Andre do. When you look at the code. Well, it's not easy to build that, obviously, but it's not that complex as an architecture because he leverage upon several protocols and just switch the money around. Obviously, you have to build things securely, but uh, I think third-party developer can build the money Legos, mm -hmm. like build new layers on existing protocols, just like you said. Yeah, and Andre is a very smart guy. I mean, what he built is, is, is pretty cool stuff and... I mean, the thing is, he's a one one man team, and and basically there was a, uh, a trade which had a lot of slippage and was not a hack, and and I think there was a lot of people from the community just like attacking and asking, hey, what's happening here, and probably not even like users, but actually just people from the community, and and there was like a lot of hysteria, and he wrote a blog post like, why building in DeFi sucks because like you try to do everything, and and then people expect that you're twenty four seven customer service uh, representative at the same time and you're a developer and, and debugging everything and we are building financial products. I mean, we if you're pushing something out there, we, we need to understand that as well. But also it kind of shows that how much we have to grow as a people and, and have better human capability. Mm, exactly. We have to be better human beings and we have to learn the, the difference. Obviously, if something happened with Avi, well, it's my job to respond. It's my job to be there. I'm on payroll and I'm really uh, interested in Avi and I'm gladly uh, 24 hour service to, uh, to respond to, uh, to anything that may happen. But Andre is not nobody payroll, nobody pays for his service. Like it's one guy yeah. uh, like coding day and night to offer us free service uh, to have like great yield, like the best yield on DeFi. And if the only answer he had is like, you, your support is not good enough, yeah, your platform is not safe enough, well, obviously he's gonna step back from the ecosystem and right. that's, we all lose from that. And yeah, I want to express my support to, to this guy and yeah. all the guys that are trying to build upon protocols and on DeFi, you are welcome here and we will do everything we can to support you guys. And Mark raised a very good thing that because like uh, what we're doing now and, and we're doing infrastructure uh, level things, uh, we kind of have to be very careful how we uh, build things and, and, and put a lot of uh, diligence um, because we, we also know that there's a lot of uh, institutions coming into the space and looking at the protocols and, and wanting to engage with them and and, and basically to make sure that we can onboard uh, different sites and <laughs> institutions, they really need to feel comfortable. Even though we're, they're using a trustless technology that they can verify instead of trusting, they, you're always running a brand game. Yeah, and just to finish uh, on that subject, uh, what happened on Iron? 
could have happened in the low liquidity pool of Uniswap. Like the exact same scenario. If you bring too much liquidity in the low leak, uh, too much money in, or assets in the low liquidity pools, you will have a huge slippage. It's uh, not a bug. It, like it's a feature. The bug is that it did not implement slippage alerts, but slippage alerts are standard for like six months in the ecosystem. Uh, it was not uh, something for the for a huge time in DeFi, and nobody uh, told it was uh, a huge issue. So no bugs. So just to, to end on this attack, and then I, I want to move on to something else. You know, th there's been some discussion around whether or not this is sort of ethical, and I think we've had similar discussions around things like the DAO hack, around the parity bug, and I like to ask you if you think these things are permissible, you know, if the code allows for it, are you of the opinion that sort of code is law or are there more ethical questions that we, one should ask around these sorts of things? One thing we should uh, ask with this question usually, like, is the code of law, is also kind of like, do we want to create something new or, or also like follow the old or something with in, in between? Because the code is law is, is pretty new thing. I mean, if you think about like, uh, I mean, if you do a hack, you hack a database, you steal a bunch of details, money, you commit a felony. And, and in that case, well, what it basically means that you have consequences. And if code is law and it permits to do that kind of thing, that's pretty fine if that's agreed. I mean, in contractual, you can agree, whatever, almost. But uh, the thing is, in that case, it will create pretty interesting dynamics, as I was mentioning about the kind of like creating the Robin Hood hackers who are just hacking protocols, making them more resilient, but also they will walk away with the funds. So the consequences can be devastating as well. And I'm not sure that people will, the old DeFi users or general public would actually be okay with that, at least this point. There's two answers to that for me. Uh, like on-chain, yeah, God is low. Because the protocol should be permissionless. Uh, we should not have KYC at the protocol level. Uh, we should treat everybody equally with exactly the same rule defined by the protocols, defined by the codes. But I want to remind everyone that uh, low is an actual thing in the mid-back ecosystem. Like uh, in the physical worlds, there, there's law, there's informants, there's jurisdiction. So if you commit on-chain a felony and that is proven to be a felony, you might have to face legal consequences. And that's two separate things. That doesn't mean we don't have law enforcement on-chain at the protocol level, that we cannot have it off-chain. Mm, and I would also like to say that uh, there is a good saying by basically, I think A16Z, that, uh, that basically software is hitting the world. And I like to some, sometimes think that at some point the law will lead the software. I mean, because like things will happen on chain that, that people will either not expect or there will be just so devastating consequences that you have to do something or have someone basically uh, take the consequences. And I think governance itself is a very, very good tool. Uh, if you think about governance, I mean, on-chain governance where people can vote, good decision can be made. And, and there's a very good history in, in the Ethereum space where something has happened or, or you have to make tough decisions and the Ethereum as a community comes up, steps up and basically make decisions that they feel that are rationally the best ones to do at this point to, to go further from, from that particular moment. So I, I definitely think that if, if you want flexibility, governance is the key and you have to have a way to govern your protocol, and that's like something that we are now working at Aave, like how we can make sure that uh, this protocol that it's open source that we are giving to the uh, public, uh, how we can all the stakeholders that are involved uh, with the tokenomics and governance can actually uh, participate, and and we have uh, measures to follow if something big happens. Let's then switch gears here and talk a little bit about privacy, and I'll start by asking you, you know, why would we want privacy in DeFi? So just just to uh, disclaim, me and Mark, we are uh, privacy experts, right? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> well, at least the, the app, uh, the trust community app say so. <laughs> we have a lot of badge of privacy somehow. No, but I mean, so, so last night you, sp you spoke on a panel about, about privacy and DeFi and you made some interesting points. And I, I think that one of the things that a lot of people don't consider is sort of the technical and design challenges around having privacy in DeFi. Mm. And I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, what are those challenges and how are they different from, you know, applying privacy, say, to layer one, like, you know, for something like Zcash. I will start or, with, with a reminder. 
uh, we are a trustless, permissionless uh, protocol. So basically, if you want to use Aave, we, you don't have to, uh, to ask the permission to anyone. You have a Web3 wallet, you have assets, you can interact directly with the protocol. Even our app is just a front end. If you want to interact with the smart contract, you can find them very easily online and interact directly. We don't know at all who are your our users for its, its just addresses. So obviously it's pseudonymous, like law enforcement can do some chain analysis and end up finding the guys, but we are not doing this work uh, for us. And it's really important for us to, to be as neutral as possible because we offer a technology as a protocol. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point because uh, the kind of like accountability, so if you see everything in the public ledger, that's big, that's, that's one of the coldest things ever. So basically, you actually see if there's any di disparency on democratic decisions, you will see like uh, lending rates uh, of each uh, on-chain protocol and, and trades and everything. So you can actually like, the coolest thing about the whole like Ethereum blockchain at this moment is that like it's auditable by anyone. But as we are moving more and more into this uh, kind of like a DeFi economy, we're getting basically paid salaries and stream salaries. In crypto, we, we, we're getting payments and we're doing interactions. People are like starting to see what kind of like a financial profiles we have. And that's also something that we want to get away from. Like we are coming from a uh, era where we have tech gi giants using our data and selling that data and selling our attention and, and basically making profit out of it. And we want to go away with that. And that's like why privacy is very important. And that's like from technical perspective, it's not easy to do and also... Privacy might, might be not something that everyone needs now. Uh, that's why like, what we are looking at privacy and, and working at Aave is, is, is basically to apply that privacy technologies like Aztec uh, into the um, uh, lending pool structure. So if there are people who want privacy, we have separate pool for that and where the assets are and transactions are sealed. Uh, and then we have a, a more general pool and, and just like customize things. And that boils down of having different kinds of offerings and different kinds of pool for Various reasons, and privacy is one of these uh, reasons. So, so, how does that work? The sort of private pool. So, the, the coolest part about the Aave protocol is that uh, we have a uh, pool manager contract. So, basically, we can create different kinds of pools, and we're based on the tokenomics. Those pools are governed. What kind of assets we can inject into this uh, Aave protocol, and, and different pools, and, and how they will be insured in the future. For example, if there is different kinds of bank run risks and so forth. So what is the cool part is that uh, with the same smart contract infrastructure, you can create a completely new pool. And by the governance, you can decide, for example, what kind of assets uh, you could basically uh, inject into this particular pool. And to have privacy, you could basically create another al alternative pool to what we have and, and basically use ZK-based assets there, for example, ZK ADI. So if you deposit uh, ZK DAI, you get in return ZK ADI and other uh, ZK-based assets. So that's like something that we are doing like a lot of research at the moment, and, and I, th I think that will be a very cool experiment. Is, is this similar to the, the concept of a, uh, a dark pool? Uh, dark, dark pool is more about uh, kind of like a OTC marketplace, but the cool thing about dark pool is that the reason why people go OTC, they want to make large trades, so if they want to sell or buy, and also that they want to hide their liquidity from the market and not affect market movements. And I think dark pools, I mean, privacy technology in dark pools is important if you want to achieve one of the biggest goals there. So I would say it's like a big dark lending pool. We should actually name it like dark, dark of a pool or something. <laughs> black ghost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, black ghost. <laughs> and to roll back to the ZK ADI, I, I think it's like I'm really interested uh, into that project and I hope uh, it will come to light on mainnet in, in the next few weeks or at least months. Because to me, it's the ultimate form of online cash. Because it's one to one with the dollar, because one ADI is always worth a die, and it grows directly into your wallet. So it's interest bearing. It's also private. And yeah, it's like the perfect tool for online money. Do you think that, that privacy is, is something that um, the Ethereum space? Is focusing enough on, and specifically with regards to DeFi, do you think that the DeFi space is focusing enough on on privacy, or, or would you like to see more efforts there? I think not at this moment. Not that much. Yeah. Not, uh, not as much as, as this moment. Uh, and 
that's where you understand the difference between uh, several blockchain ecosystems. Like, for example, in Bitcoin, they, are, you, they have like so many cool tools. They have Wasabi, they have Samurai Wallet, they have Weirpool, uh, they have the CoinJoin uh, protocols. They have so many stuff. And if you want to mix your coin on Bitcoin, you just download the Samurai Wallet and you do it from your wallet. It's super easy to join a pool, super easy to mix, super easy to spend, uh, super easy to uh, deposit your Bitcoin and go to the Lightning Network. Bitcoin is really focused on that. I will say as the opportunities to build things are wider yeah, in Ethereum, the focus is not as much directed uh, into privacy. I do believe it will happen eventually because right now it's magic internet money for a lot of person. But since we have the stable coins and stable coins are becoming more and more a thing, we starting to understand, well, if you look at my ENS address that is very easy to find, you will see exactly how much I earn at Ave every month. Yeah, you can check my address and you can know my salary. Yeah, and I copy and, like that's yeah. why I copy Mark's strategies on, on the uh, <laughs> yeah. on yield hacking. So basically, yeah, some this, people this is, this watch on chain what I do. You, you, you <laughs> can do so sort of, like copy you know, trading, uh, <laughs> yeah. like front running. You, you you can do, of course, like you can look at one's salary or yeah. sort of figure out like uh, you know uh, one's positions on things. But like you you can also copy strategies. So someone could build a system whereby they're like scanning the blockchain figuring out which strategies people are executing and, and you have sort of like, you build like a decentralized eToro copy trader type type of function. Without the, the scam part. With yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be cool. I think there's, there's like... A, Set Protocol is working on that, yeah, actually. It's yeah. pretty cool stuff that you can you can basically follow others and the social trading is pretty, pretty neat that they came up with it. And they're actually uh, thinking about uh, utilizing flash loans for, for basically closing a reopening position. So I, I think the whole space is exploded with the flash loans and I, I just can't wait to see more more stuff. Uh, but in terms of the um, uh, the, the, the privacy and what you, what you can do, uh, there's a lot of issues, especially in trading with the, with the front running, for example, that uh, if you have some interesting transaction that you want to perform and someone basically scans it and, and just front runs your transaction. And, and I, I think it's becoming even like a business. I, I keep hearing all the time that, okay, I wanted to make a transaction and someone <laughs> front run at me and, and yeah. that's pretty crazy. It, it happened to me uh, in all other context, in the Claros context. Mm -hmm. And basically, yeah, they, they are doing like generalized front run uh, scripts that monitor the Ethereum main pools and front run you uh, if the trade is profitable to them. That's somewhat an issue for Ethereum uh, in midterm that can turn into an issue. Not a real issue right now, but that can turn into an issue. But obviously, uh, the good thing is that that can be uh, mitigated. You, you can create some kind of only ports, uh, fake transaction, uh, do some beating gas words. Uh, like, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. But yeah, it's quite interesting, this ecosystem where everything is auditable. Like, it's a brand new thing that, that never happened in traditional finance. Like, nobody was aware of every single transaction. Uh, I don't know if it will turn into a dystopia or not. Uh, like, all the opportunities are open at this space. There's so many cool things, you know, and I just, like, we can't even imagine what's happening, like, within a few months because things will change a lot. I mean, it's just, um, it's a space that just keeps evolving and evolving. That's, that's, that's the coolest part here. So one final question before we wrap up here, and this kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier, and it's, you know, we, we did touch on, on it a little bit, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the speed at which things are evolving. And obviously that, that has you know, many positive effects because we're seeing like a proliferation of applications and there's a lot of innovation and people are doing really cool things and, and building like a lot of really, really cool things. And that's happening here at this event. And, you know, just in the last month with like ETH Denver, ETH London, and now like ETH CC, there's just like a lot of new, new stuff being built. So that's really cool, and it's like it's interesting to see that. Uh, but at the same time, there are, there are risks to that, and like one of the, one of the risks is attacks like this one, or, or others, you know, the, the many other types of attacks that have uh, happened in the past. What advice do you would you have to give to the space with regards to you know how the ecosystem as a whole should innovate, yet at the same time be cautious, say, of uh, overzealousness and moving a little bit too fast, perhaps where we end up in situations where types of attacks like the, the one we talked about uh, can happen or 
we fall into a dystopia or people are arrested by the... I, I was talking to uh, John Shipton, uh, Julian Assange's father yesterday, and, you know, where he talks about a situation where if people in the Ethereum space are building things that go against the interests of, say, governments like the U.S., well, they can get extradited. Uh, yeah. Just like there are many sort of uh, computer scientists uh, that are uh, uh, facing extradition to the U.S. at the moment, Julian Assange as well. Like, Yeah, I, I think, like, that's the thing. That's the thing. We're building things maybe a bit too fast, but uh, innovation is something you can't, you can't slow down easily, and you should not be able to slow it down because that's in your interest. But the thing is, like, Part of that innovation, like the security is very important. And also, like, if you look at the whole regulation space, that's like, that's the next thing. I mean, now all the DeFi protocols, they are building towards more decentralized direction or journey. There are protocols with admin keys, for example, but still they have a, like a plan to be more decentralized and they have a reason for it. So uh, there are a few decisions where you basically might have a safe harbor uh, for a protocol that is sufficiently decentralized. So it avoids certain type of regulation. And I think people are now building towards that direction. And if there is, will be in the future this kind of safe harbor when this kind of like grayness of regulation goes out and there's more clear rules, what will be interesting is that a completely new economy will be born. But if you go to a same path where uh, basically everything needs to be KYC'd and, and everything will become very, very regulated, uh, we actually are... <laughs> Just having running uh, very expensive uh, MySQL databases, uh, and that's not the kind of uh, thing what you can achieve with DeFi and, and the blockchain technology. Yeah, that's not what I sign up for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I want out if that happens. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's really important to keep the ethos. We are decentralized and permissionless, no KYC. Obviously. On those money Legos, well, you can build a layer two, a layer three, and uh, something that. As a great UX, you, you can put your passport in and down the way, it's the money end up supply to Aave and then there's new Maidenmans. At the end of the day, it's the first time in uh, financial history that people have choice. If you want to deep dive and understand what is Web3, you don't have to use that fancy easy thing that takes some commission and you can download Web3 and go directly to, into Aave. And we have the choice and that's brand new and we should uh, embrace it. Cool, that's a great note to end on. Thank you for joining me today in the booth, yeah. uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank, Thank you, you, Thank you very so much. much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.